Health, psychology, and human nature with Andre Stureson. Hey friends, hope you're having a great day. Are you following me on Instagram and Facebook? Please go to Health, Psychology and Human Nature on Instagram or Facebook or both for that matter to get the latest episodes, inspiration and more. Please take a pause and go there. Also, if you like the episode, please share it with a friend, family member or somebody else who you think might like it. Welcome back, friends, to another episode of Health, Psychology, and Human Nature, a science-focused podcast where we explore, learn, and improve our lives together. How does calorie restriction, intermittent fasting, exercise, stress, drugs, supplements affect our aging and health? You will learn all about it in today's episode with Professor Brian Kennedy. Aging is very important to focus on since it is a big risk factor when it comes to a lot of different chronic diseases such as Alzheimer's, cancer and diabetes. Brian, he is the director of the National University Health System Center for Healthy Aging in Singapore. He and his lab is directed at understanding the biology of aging and translating research discoveries into new ways of delaying, detecting and also preventing and treating aging and associated diseases. Friends, I really hope you enjoy today's episode. Brian, welcome to the show. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I think uh, it's going to be a very interesting com- conversation. So big, big thank you for, uh, for coming on. Oh, anytime I can talk about aging, I'm there. <laughs> that sounds good. I think we should we should start off by uh, talking a little bit by about your interest. So, I mean, you're really into aging and also how we can live healthier, longer. So, what is it with aging, being able to live longer and being able to live healthier, longer that fascinates you, or like why are you interested in this? Well, it's funny, you know, when I got started working on aging. I was working in yeast cells in, in my graduate career at MIT, and at that time I wasn't really thinking about human aging at all. I just thought that the question of aging is really one of the biggest unanswered questions in biology, and we could use yeast cells to at least get an answer in a simple organism, whether it corresponded directly to humans or not, we, who, who knew. Uh, but you know, as we worked with yeast, we discovered that sirtuins in the TOR pathway and Many of the pathways that regulate yeast aging also seem to regulate uh, mammalian aging. So uh, that uh, slowly got me much more focused on human aging. And uh, what's striking is that we tend to ignore the fact that aging is the biggest risk factor for almost every disease we really are scared of. And it's also the biggest risk factor for mortality due to viruses like coronavirus and influenza. Uh, and so it it became clear, you know, as I was working on this, that it's critical to really see if we can do something about aging, because rather than trying to treat one disease at a time, if we could slow the rate of aging, we could have a positive effect on a whole range of different outcomes simultaneously. Really interesting. And I think that point is so important that aging seems to be the biggest risk factor for a lot of chronic diseases. Could you elaborate a little bit uh, on that? Yeah, you know, you look at the funding at the National Institute of Health, they put a tremendous amount of funding over the years into understanding why cholesterol is a risk factor for heart disease. Really, it's about a threefold increase in risk for cardiac events. Uh, That's nothing compared to aging. You you don't see people in their 20s uh, getting heart attacks, at least it's exceedingly rare. Um, so aging is like a hundredfold increased risk for cardiovascular disease and cancer yeah. and diabetes and Alzheimer's and macular degeneration. And I could go on and on and on. And yet I think that we don't put much money into research in aging. I think people have just assumed that aging is a natural process that you can't do anything about. And yet 
we know in model organisms it's relatively easy to modify aging, probably easier than it is to treat diseases. Uh, and so I think that will likely be true in humans as well. So, you know, I think that the best way we can pr improve the health of humanity is by targeting aging because we'll keep people healthy, functional, disease-free much longer in life. Right. And for those who doesn't really understand, when we're talking about aging and then we're talking about that aging is a major risk factor for a lot of different diseases, what do we mean by that? Could you explain that a little bit more, Snipper, for those who really doesn't understand? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, that you look at the standard definitions of uh, aging and I find them pretty unhelpful. It's sort of, you know, <laughs> <Okay. Yeah. laughs> I mean, if I can swear for a moment, it, it's sort of shit happens and then you die. You know, it doesn't really <laughs> tell you okay. much information. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the way I think about aging is that there are a lot of things happening as you get older. In fact, you know, even by the time you're 40, we can measure that you're not functionally as good as you were when you were 20. You can't run 100 meters as fast. You don't see any 40-year-old pro soccer players out there. Probably your cognitive skills, we could measure some differences there in terms of you know, neuronal transmission and stuff like that. But your body's still healthy and functional. So I think that damage is happening as you, throughout life, but for most of your life, your body compensates for that damage. And essentially, you have a, a network that maintains your health. Uh, and that involves many of the pathways that we've found are linked to aging. The problem is that when enough damage happens, that network starts to break down. And you can think of it as spinning out of equilibrium. And depending on which direction you go, you get one disease or a different disease or some combination of diseases. So our goal is really not to wait until you're out of equilibrium because trying to treat that is like reversing entropy. Our goal is more to keep that network functioning, keep you healthy and prevent the diseases from happening in the first place. Right. So, so aging is kind of like a, yeah, it's like, it's kind of like a network that breaks down s slowly or yeah, can, can be done faster as well, depending on a lot of different things, I guess. And, and then do that's to, how I think of it. Yeah. Yeah. And then they, due to that, then a lot of stuff, bad stuff happens like and then you can get a different diseases depending on your genetics and your environment or is that how it works or yeah so your genetic predisposition your environment your lifestyle combined with uh this slow decline in this network uh lead to various diseases and and uh um but the key feature is that the thing in common with all of them is aging and so uh, and maybe the most malleable part of the whole process is aging, too. So uh, I think that's something we have to find out because the potential is, is really tremendous. When you say that, c could you elaborate on that? So you think that it's the most malleable, uh, really malleable thing as well? Yeah, I, that's, I mean, it's a hypothesis. Uh, I, I don't know that we have all the proof of that. I think that, you know, it's funny, when I started in aging, it was right around the time people were discovering genes that could slow aging in simple systems like worms and flies and yeast. Uh, and right when I started, there were still lots of people that said, you'll never find a change in one gene or you'll never find one drug <laughs> yeah. that can slow aging because it's so complicated. Uh, and there's no way tweaking one thing can affect aging. But what we've learned is that it's really easy to slow aging. You know, if you look at the yeast genome, if I mutate all the genes randomly and ask which ones affect aging, about 5% of those genes can extend lifespan. And it's made us think about aging in a different way. Uh, I think that, you know, we're, you know, I think you have to, first of all, take an evolutionary point of view. We're optimized for fitness, and fitness means living long enough to have babies, maybe raising the babies, helping them have babies, get, making sure your genes pass on. It's not about how long you live. You know, if you live long enough to do those things, it may be that natural selection to keep you healthy just declines from yeah. that point. Yeah. So in, a, in essence, we're not optimized to live a really long time. So if you want to improve upon a system, you don't want to improve upon a perfectly functioning Tesla, you're not going to make subtle changes to make that car better necessarily. But if you have like an old Volkswagen, you can change the oil and see a big effect already. <laughs> so yeah. I, I think that, 
I think that you know we're we're working with a system that's optimized for something else, and now we're trying to reprogram it to do better, uh, to to stay healthy longer. And I think that there are lots of changes that will have that effect. So my my theory is that it's going to be relatively easy to uh, affect aging, at least in a modest way. I don't know about massive extensions yet, but in a modest way. Uh, and it's probably going to be easier to do that than it is to wait till you have some severe disease and try to reverse that problem. Right. What makes you say that you think it's going to be easy? Well, relatively easy, I said. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah okay, relatively I, I think, easy. I think that's because there, there are many, many different pathways that we can modify in yeast and worms and flies and even mice that will make those mice stay healthy longer. I don't think there's any reason to think as humans that we're fundamentally different than all the other creatures on earth um so you know that what that's led to is lots of different candidates strategies to affect human aging everything from lifestyle change to supplements to drugs to more radical things like stem cells and i think the challenge is that we none of us really know which ones are going to work the best in humans i think most of the aging field believes that some of those interventions will work and you can argue already that exercise works. Uh, and I, I think that the challenge now is to start to agnostically test them to see which ones are, have more efficacy than others in the human context. And that is something that you are about to do and are doing right now. Um, like, What is important when you try these different interventions to affect aging? Like, what, what, yeah, what, is, what is important when you do that kind of research? Um, the biggest challenge in the uh, uh, human aging area is what are we going to use as an outcome? Uh, I don't think any of my graduate students want to start giving people interventions and wait 70 years to see if they live longer. So uh, we have to have some surrogate marker to determine whether we're affecting aging or not. So a lot of people realize that there have been a number of discoveries of possible interventions uh, that might slow human aging. I think what's less understood in the public is that there are now reasonably good biomarkers of aging as well. Uh, and these have come from artificial intelligence-based analysis of deep data sets uh, trying to predict uh, chronologic age in individuals. And, and now we have many of these different kinds of markers. The epigenetic clock is the most famous of them. Uh, and when you run that clock, it roughly predicts your age, but it may... This say, well, I'm 53, this take me. It may say that I'm 45, or it may say that I'm 60. Uh, and that divergence from my chronologic age is, in theory, my biologic age. And so if I'm 45, it means I'm aging well. If I'm 60, it means I'm not aging so well. Uh, and so there's already some evidence that these markers like this can adjust to intervention. So if you do something that slows aging, you might reverse that clock. So we're using those types of markers as outcomes to determine whether our interventions are affecting aging or not. So it's really a, a two-step process that's, that's driven the field forward. The development of interventions and now more recently the development of markers to measure aging in humans. None of the markers are completely validated yet, but I think many of them show a lot of promise. And uh, we're going to... Um, it, to start with, at least, make the bet that interventions of around six months will be sufficient to change those biomarkers. And, and about these um, different biomarkers of aging, like how reliable would you say that they are? Well, uh, I think that there's again, they're, so far so good. They look very, very good. They can, if you look at um, this, take the epigenetic clock as an example. But again, there are other other clocks out there as well. Um, it can you know, predict uh, age from um, basically cell, many different kinds of tissues in the body. So you can take blood samples from, from old data sets like in Haines or UK Biobank, where we already have mortality data, and you can run the clock on that, and it can actually predict mortality. So the people that scored younger when they were a certain age, like 60, on their biologic clock were the ones that live longer. Um, so that's good. Uh, there are already interventions using that clock in mice that show that you can take, if you take rapamycin or calorie restriction, you can slow the, the rate of change of that clock 
which is another good thing. You want the intervention to be able to respond, or the biomarker to be able to respond to the interventions. Uh, and uh, it seems like these kinds of clocks are predictive in a number of different ethnicities. So, um, you know, everything looks good, but of course, it hasn't reached the standard that, the, say, the FDA would approve it as an official biomarker of aging. I think more research needs to be done, but but uh, so far, so good. Right. Interesting. Um, and I think perhaps we should also get into the, the different interventions and things you can do about aging. Um, and I would just like to ask you, of all the things that everyday people have access to today, what do you think are the most important things when it comes to having a positive effect on lifespan? Well, I think, first of all, we have to start with lifestyle interventions because we know those things work. And, and actually, many people are doing the wrong thing. I mean, the, the FDA, for instance, recommends 2,200 calories a day for um, a male my size. So I'm like, uh, like 80, 88 kilograms. And uh, um, the average American male is eating 3,900 calories a day. Yeah. Um, and in, in Europe and the, most of the other, most of the rest of the world, people are eating too much as well, or maybe not quite that bad. Uh, so, you know, when the research on aging is telling us that reduced nutrient intake is probably making you live longer, we have a, most of the developed world anyway is eating too much food. So trying to get a balanced diet that uh, gets closer to the recommended calorie intake, I think is a something that's really important. Uh, then uh, if you want to do more than, go ahead. Uh, but before, before we, uh, if, 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 if we're about to change the topic, like, so, so would you say that the most important thing is just reducing your calories or is it also what you eat? Well, I, I think there's a lot of debate on what you eat. So they have, uh, a lot of people telling us that uh, paleo diets or uh, fat's okay now um, and the carbs are the problem. But if you look in animal models, uh, in an isocaloric environment, in other words, all the animals are fed the same calories, the ones that get higher carbohydrates and lower proteins actually live longer than the ones that get high amount of protein. Mm, so uh, I, I think that I try to steer clear of making specific recommendations and just say to try to keep a balanced diet and don't eat too much. Now, one thing I think is very promising is intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding. Um, there's a lot of data to suggest that calorie restriction will probably work in many respects, and that's basically eating only as many calories as you absolutely need, uh, so enough to avoid malnutrition and then nothing much more. However, that lifestyle is very hard for most people to adopt. Uh, but doing things like eating all of your food within 12-hour window each day or maybe even an 8-hour window each day or doing periods of fasting also shows great promise. And I think that's more sustainable for, for, for more people. So um, that kind of uh, time-restricted diet I think shows a lot of promise and it's it's something that a lot of people can do but does it seem like it's the reduction of calories due to not eating in the morning for example or do you think it's also the component of not eating if you understand uh, the think, question <laughs> yeah, so i think it's the period of time a substantial period of time each day without eating that's important you know they, they've done studies in mice where they compare um uh cal uh calorie restricted mice to mice that they just feed as much as they want every other day uh, and they both live longer but it turns the interesting thing is the mice on the every other day feeding eat almost as much as the mice that have all the food all the time because when the days they have food they eat almost twice as much so that would suggest that at least some of the benefit is from uh, going periods of time without eating and that may uh alter your metabolism in your body to uh, generate a, a, a more protective state um, on a daily basis. So I think that um, uh, it, a lot of it is, is going that period of time without eating. Right. So just to understand about the, the study about the, the mice here. So it was that one of the, one of the groups could eat ad, lib, ad libitum or could they eat as much as they want or did they also have a reduced diet or like a reduced number of calories? Or? Yeah. So so you, you have an ad-lib group that can eat as much as it wants, and you have an every-other-day feeding group. 
and it turns out that the every other day feeding group eats as much, almost as much as the ad lib group, because on days when it has food, it eats they eat almost twice as much. But but they still live longer, or and they still live longer. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So then it seems to be not 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 perhaps not the calories in that case. Then it seems to be the period of not eating then. It could be some combination, and remember that we're giving these mice, well, the mice are on an ad lib diet, and they probably overeat some, but I think also the trying to compare that to the human situation is a bit different, where so many of us are eating way too many calories. I, I think that reducing the calories for many people is good, <laughs> and the time restricted the time restricted feeding may also be good, so the combination may be the best. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. Also, I mean, also if you eat junk food, then it's also, of course, a lot harder to not eat too much. And if you eat like a lot of stuff with fibers, vegetables, and stuff, then it's a lot harder also to get. I mean, to eat more calories. So, so that might that might also be one of the explanations to why it's so hard to to keep a low calorie intake on like a bad diet. Yeah, I think that's right. And also keep in mind that diets are personalized. You know, what's optimal for one person may not be optimal for another based on their allergies, their microbiome, their lifestyle, and and how much they exercise. You know, I think that it, my guess is for a relatively sedentary person uh, who's not frail uh, yet, uh, I think that uh, probably a low-protein diet is healthy. But if you're out there exercising and pushing your muscles, you definitely need more protein. So um, – we talk about these variables as if they are not related to each yeah, other, but it's yeah. not the case. They're actually interdependent. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, so would you say that reducing your, the amount of calories, not, not so, so you get malnourished, but reducing your amount of calories and the intermittent fasting component, having breaks bef- between your meals, um, would you say that those two are probably the, the best interventions when it comes to instead extending your your lifespan or well i think that uh we'd have to put exercise in there is probably the best because we have more long-term data on exercise if you look at things like the stanford runners study um, these are people in palo alto in california that exercise on a regular basis and uh, they compared them to people in the same uh, environment that don't exercise and there's dramatic effects on lifespan, not just reduced diabetes and heart disease, but reduced Alzheimer's. And at least to this point, the life expectancy is much higher in that study. Um, I, 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 you know, there, there's nev- those kinds of studies are never perfect, uh, but I think there's enough of uh, work on exercise to suggest that it really does keep you healthy longer. Well, the interesting question about exercise is whether it would increase maximum lifespan or not. And some of the mouse data suggests that if you exercise mice, more the mice get to their maximum lifespan, but it doesn't really push that maximum lifespan. Interesting. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. So, but that's a win, you know, from a human perspective. If we can keep people healthy longer and compress morbidity, uh, I, we're doing good. So, uh, some com- some sustainable combination of uh, cardiovascular exercise with maybe some a little bit of resistance in there uh, is almost certainly healthy for you. Right. Yeah. I mean, you want to be he- healthy as long as you can and then just die. Kind of. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's at least the second best option. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. But, but when it comes to exercise, because from my understanding also, you can also exercise too much. Um, do, do you, do you like, do you know if, if we have any data on that, like the amount of exercise that is good when it comes to extending lifespan and health span? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question that we don't really have good data on. The there is an argument that if you're pushing your body too hard, you can cause uh, damage like to your heart and other tissues. Um, and uh, I think that we really don't have good data from an aging perspective on that. Uh, I think that would that would probably you know apply to one percent of the population. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. the, the vast. The, yeah, the Iron Man, the Iron Man not people. Not exercising enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I'm not one of them right now. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, okay. But, and do you, is there also like a, a minimum amount that you would need to do? Do you know if there's any data on that or? Yeah, there's a lot of data on that. And again, it depends on your abilities. You know, if you have someone who's, 
already frail, you know, probably some level of activity is good for them, but certainly not as much as, uh, you know, a 40 year old person who's still healthy. So the first thing is that you have to uh, choose exercise uh, that fits within your capacity uh, and also within your lifestyle. So it, it's, uh, um, you know, if you're running two hours a day, I'm like I'm running a lot right now because I'm pretty much don't have that don't have anything else to do. Yeah, exactly. So, you need an uh, outlet in these times so, as well. Yeah, so that's great. But you know, so I'm averaging maybe 25 miles a month or a week right now. Uh, but whether I can sustain that once I go back to my travel schedule and everything else is is questionable. So uh, I think a lot of it is really finding ways to do exercise that you're interested in that you enjoy and that you can sustain uh, and I think that's the biggest challenge people have a hard time uh, incorporating some kind of exercise in their lifestyle that's sustainable right okay so we have we have calories restriction we have intermittent fasting time restricted eating it would probably be a better word we have exercise um, except for those three what, what would you say comes next for an everyday person well, again, I, I want to get to supplements and drugs at some point, but let me discuss two other things briefly. Yeah, sure. Uh, one, one is stress. I, I think managing your levels of stress is really important. Uh, I don't have good animal data on that. It's very hard to do research on that. For sure. Uh, but, but I think that so many people go through lives in a state of uh, anxiety or stress, uh, and I think uh, my sense is that that's not good for healthy aging. Um, and it's probably not so much the amount of the stressful life they're exposed to. It's how they process that stress and uh, whether they're aware and can manage it. I, I think that's partly where mindfulness comes in is that sort of any form of mindfulness that, uh, mindfulness that allows you to be sort of introspective uh, and allows you to recognize the stress that you have and help manage it. It's probably going to be good for you in the long term. And then the one thing I would add to that is also sleep. It's not easy for people as they age sometimes to manage quality sleep, but it's certainly, you know, quality sleep is important for healthy aging. So if you're not sleeping well, if you have chronic problems sleeping, I think that might be something to go take an active approach to dealing with. Right. When it comes to stress, like what are the mechanisms of how stress impacts your health span and lifespan and yeah yeah <laughs> maybe we could start there <laughs> yeah I, I think that we're still trying to understand that again that this is an area that doesn't have the benefit of as many studies in animal models so people do study stress in animals um, but it's uh, um, it, it hasn't been studied in the, as much in the context of aging we know, for instance, though, if you take mice and put them in an enriched environment where they're more comfortable, they live longer. If you take mice and put them alone as opposed to in a, a small group, they live shorter. So yeah. it, it seems clear that even in animals that, that stress is probably impacting aging. Um, you know, our, I think it's difficult to, to point to one thing that, you know, our mental state is doing to alter aging processes because, again, your brain is so interconnected. You know, when you get stressed or depressed, you tend to eat more. It affects your regulation of food intake. It affects, you know, all kinds of different things in your brain that probably ultimately lead to unhealthier habits and increased chronic inflammation. And um, it's probably not one pathway we can point to that, that connects those dots. Right. And you also speak of, uh, or you also mentioned being aware of being stressed. Like, why, why would that be important? I, I, th I this is we're verging more into my personal okay yeah uh, un, un, uh, uneducated opinions here yeah. but I, I, f I just I know that you know well one let me give you a personal example so when I took over running the Buck Institute it was an institute of about 250 people um, something is happening to somebody all the time and so there's somebody worried about a grant or somebody worried about losing their job etc all the time and if you if you the first couple of years I was doing that I found that I was um, I didn't really understand it but I was feeling really stressed I was yeah, taking yeah. things home with me uh, and then I as gradually became more aware of that and to sort of recognize when my body is feeling stressed and once I could recognize it then I could 
you know, do something to to get things under control. And so I think half the battle to dealing with stress is understanding when you're stressed. And a lot of people, if you watch people, you know, everybody knows people that seem like they're stressed a lot, but they, they don't seem to be self-aware of that. And I think not not being self-aware means you're going to not be able to really do much about it. So I think that's a good first step. And my guess is that's one of the benefits of mindfulness is that it you know, attempts to block all the external factors out and think about, you know, what's really, you know, affecting you and how is your brain working? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's hard to do something about something. I mean, it's hard to do something about a problem which you do and you're not aware of. Yeah, I yeah. think, and I think that's a factor for many people. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, yeah. And you also, um, you also mentioned some other big categories here i think you said supplements and you also you also men mentioned um, uh, drugs right yeah yeah um let me perhaps start with supplements i think that um you know the the natural product space is really interesting if you go to the 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 your your supplement store you can find uh Tons of products that say anti-aging on them, everything from skin creams to pills you take. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, the, and I think most of the hardcore scientists in aging research have uh, sort of just ignored this and said, well, this is not scientific. There's no, you know, nobody's done the experiments. And, and um, they certainly, they're, to some extent, they're right. I, I can't walk into the store and tell you which of those things might work and which ones don't. Uh, but what we decided to do and what other people in the field have decided to do more recently is really begin to enter this space, try to see if we can find natural products that may impact aging. And there's one real advantage to natural products, and that's that they're much easier to get to market. So yeah, yeah. let's say I found a perfect drug with no side effects that slowed aging by 10 years. It would take, it'd still take a long time to get approval for that, to disseminate that drug to people because aging is not a disease. So we have to think about what disease indication that we want the FDA to approve our drug for. And then we have to think about reimbursement policies so that once we produce the drug that the insurance companies will pay us back for uh, giving it to people. And, and so there's all kinds of challenges with drugs and uh, that, and there are less challenges with natural products. I'm not saying that you can do anything you want. There's still regulation, but uh, there's less regulation. So the question is, could we find things that um, are natural products or even on the grass list, which is generally regarded as safe, uh, that impact aging? And I think there's several candidates for that now. Probably the most um, um, well-known of them are... Uh, uh, supplements that increase your NAD levels. This is a, a cofactor in, in your body for hundreds of different chemical reactions. And it seems like the levels of NAD decrease with age. Uh, you can't give NAD directly, but you can give precursors that your body converts to NAD, yeah. like nicotinamide riboside and nicotinamide mononucleotide, uh, that seem to be having, well, in mice, they have benefits on health, long-term health. And uh, they may have similar effects in humans. And then uh, some research that I was involved with, uh, sponsored by a company called PDL Health, uh, and I'm, I'm actually involved with the company as well, uh, we identified other natural products that seem to impact aging in animals. Uh, probably the foremost of these is uh, uh, alpha-ketoglutarate, which is a um, natural component of your metabolic pathways. Uh, and it, again, it goes down with aging. And in animals, if we start at 18 months, in mice, if we supplement with AKG, we only extend the lifespan by about 5 to 10%. But the important thing is we reduce frailty by almost 50%. Wow. So these animals stay healthy for a very long time. And then at the very end, they get sick and die. So what we're doing is compressing morbidity. So um, what PDL Health has done is combine the AKG with some... Uh, other products and it's actually on the market so we're actually doing the human clinical studies now we don't really have data yet but we have some anecdotal data at least that it's, it's promising so we're hopeful that that this product may be beneficial as well 
And I suspect there are others out there in the natural product space that are being either already been proposed or being uh, d- uh, discovered right now that may also be helpful. So we think this is a promising area to be in. Right. Um, like, and, w- w- what did you say? Like, how how many? Or you, you mentioned two different natural supplements now, right? Or yeah, I mentioned uh, NAD precursors and AKG. Yeah, right. And and like, how how much uh, like how much research has been done on them and in animal studies? Well, um, a fair amount, probably a little bit more for the NAD precursors than AKG, but yeah. Um, uh, both are shown to be beneficial in the context of overnutrition. They protect against high-fat diet in animals. Um, both of them it's extend aspects of health span in animals. Uh, AKG uh, has prob- potentially a bigger effect on lifespan, um, but that's um, neither of them have uh, huge effects. Uh, I think that uh, I haven't seen clear studies looking at frailty the way we've looked at it uh, with the NAD precursors, uh, so I can't compare that directly to AKG, but both of them uh, show some promise, and both of those are available on the market now. Um, how how safe are they? Uh, well, AKG has been widely tested in human studies for other purposes, not for aging, and actually, it's shown benefit in some contexts. For instance, uh, postmenopausal women. Uh, have reduced bone loss when they take alpha ketoglutarate in a clinical study, not not our study, so and other groups. Um, and so AKG is extremely safe. It's been given up to three grams a day to people without toxic effects. Um, and it seems to be true as well for these NAD precursors in humans. They uh, they seem to have very high safety profiles. So again, these two molecules they do different things in the body, but they're similar in respect that they go down with aging. And really, their core, they, they both serve core metabolic functions. So one thing you can think about is if you lose the levels of these molecules, you lose sort of the metabolic flexibility in the cell. Um, your cells have to adapt to a continually changing environment, different nutrients, different stress factors, and they have to reroute metabolism in different directions depending on what's available. Um, molecules like this, I think, are helpful in that they allow those channels to reroute uh, effectively. And if they go down with age, you, the cells are less adaptive. That's kind of one way I think about it. Interesting. And what, what did you say? Like, what effects had you um, seen when you used these in animal studies? And The AKG, uh, uh, you know, we, I, I think this is a challenge. Let me, let me just state this up front. Yeah, and this applies yeah. to drugs like, drugs like rapamycin and metformin. Anything that slows aging... If you look at the pillars or hallmarks of aging, it affects almost all of them because, again, it's a network. So yeah, you have yeah. a drug that's doing one thing, but the downstream readout of that goes in many directions. So this, this take rapamycin, for an example. If you treat animals with rapamycin, you get better adult stem cell function with age, less inflammation, um, better nutrient signaling, uh, less damage. Uh, less uh, damage caused by senescent cells specifically. So all of these things seem to be readouts. Uh, epigenetic clock is a readout. Uh, the question is, what's it doing directly? And so similarly with AKG, um, we can see that stem cells function better with age, uh, dramatic reduction in inflammation, um, and uh, some anecdotal evidence that we're affecting the epigenetic clock. Uh, but uh, the the other question is, what's the direct effect of alpha ketoglutarate? And we're still trying to sort that out. I think it's an an interesting it's an interesting puzzle with this aging field because if you look at all these different pathways of aging, all of them appear to be affected. But um, what exactly are these interventions doing is still kind of an open question. I think that the the somewhat unsatisfactory answer to that is that. They touch some node in this this network that <laughs> yeah. mediates healthy aging, yeah. and they allow that network to persist longer. And then you can read that out at many of the different endpoints in the network. Right. Yeah. I mean, it will be very interesting to know what. I mean, well, it will be very interesting to see what will what we've found in. I mean, twenty or thirty years about these different. But yeah. But it's it's. I mean, it's a it's a fascinating idea to to use these different natural supplements, which you do not have to go through an entire FDA approval for, so you can actually get them to market 
earlier and if you can see that they're not i mean that they're very safe and that they also provide a benefit i mean then it's just seems to be uh yeah it seems to be a good idea yeah i th- i think that they're at the end of the day we may find drugs and stem cell therapies that have much bigger effects but i don't know but for right now i think those things are probably the first things that may have a relatively big impact on aging um so we're excited about supplements. We're also testing drugs, of course, and, and doing stem cell research and other things. Yeah, because one thing that I found when it when it seems to I'm I'm not I haven't really gotten that deep into the re, all the research that you, the fantastic job that you and others are doing. But I mean, I've gotten an insight, and it seems like there's like lifestyle factors and stuff like that that we actually can use right away. But I mean, rapamycin, metformin. I mean, these drugs they don't seem to be for like the everyday person. Um, so, I mean, to find different interventions that we actually can use, like uh, in, in the near future seems to be uh, like a good, a good thing, of course. Well, let's talk about metformin and rapamycin for a minute because I don't com- really completely agree with that. First of all, metformin is something millions of people already use. So yeah. if you get diagnosed with hyperglycemia, um, the first line of defense is something like metformin, which is a drug that reduces your glucose levels. Um, it's not perfectly safe, um, but it's among drugs, it's one of the safest drugs you can find. Most people have very little uh, side effect, long-term side effects from it. Um, and so that's one reason it's sort of leading the way in terms of clinical studies to see whether ag- you can slow aging or not. And so near Barzilai is leading this TAME study in the U.S., which is taking a different approach. They're, excuse me, they're looking at uh, thousands of people in their 60s to see if they can treat with metformin and prevent the onset of multiple different kinds of chronic diseases simultaneously. So this is also a a productive strategy to target aging um, clinically. Uh, The problem, excuse me, the problem is that yeah, I had something to drink and I haven't learned to swallow yet. <laughs> you um, can, if, you, if you want, you can just take like a short break if you want to uh, drink no, some water. I'm okay now. Yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. So, <laughs> sorry. So the, the TAME study, uh, you know, is a very large, expensive study, but it's directly designed to see if you can preserve health span. So the advantage is it, it looks at health span directly, uh, but there's a very high cost. But the reason metformin was chosen is it's a, ver- a very safe drug. Uh, Rapamycin also, I think, shows promise for human use. Um, Yeah, it can have side effects. There's no doubt about that at high enough dose or in combination with other immunosuppressant drugs. But if dosed correctly, uh, I think it's possible to manage those side effects. And there's some promise that it may uh, affect aging processes already in human studies. Um, the other thing about rapamycin is you can give it to animals for a very short window of time, as little as two to three months, and have an impact on the whole aging of the of the animal. So you can treat mice from 20 to 23 months, and they still live longer even though you stop the treatment at 23 months. So these mice are dying on at like an average of 31, 32 months instead of 27 or 28, even though you stop treatment at 23. So that suggests that we might be able to do intermittent dosing in humans as well. And if that's possible, it'll reduce the potential for side effects. So to me, the TOR pathway is really the most promising pathway in aging. I, I say that partly because I worked on it a lot. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but it, if you reduce TOR signaling, it extends lifespan pretty much everywhere we've looked. Uh, and uh, the human data, you know, looks promising. So... I think that it's certainly a pathway to to look at more deeply. Right. So you believe that so rapamycin and metformin is quite safe then? I I, I, I don't want to say quite safe. I, okay. I think that you you always have to with metformin if you follow the recommendations for dosing, uh, it's probably very safe. Uh, now we don't have as much data in healthy people. Most people that take metformin have hyperglycemia, but the suggestion is that it doesn't reduce glucose levels uh, down to dangerously low levels even in healthy people. Um, Rapamycin has to be done correctly. I mean, it can have side effects. There's no doubt about that. So 
Um, I, I don't want to say that it's quite safe, but I think that if we did, can develop dosing strategies that mitigate those side effects, we might be able to see efficacy in, in, in human aging. So I, I would suggest that I don't want to advocate people going out and self-prescribing drugs, uh, but I think both of those drugs show promise if we develop them correctly. Right. How far into the future do you think that a, a drug like rapamycin or metformin or something else will be administered to a bigger part of the population? Um, I think that's an interesting question. Uh, the and and sort of each drug has its own set of answers. Uh, the case with metformin, you know, if this team trial shows promise. Uh, the FDA has said that they will at least look at the concept of targeting aging to prevent multiple diseases, this health span approach. Uh, of course, that doesn't mean the FDA moves super fast yeah. either, and so yeah. there will still be some time involved. Uh, the challenge with this clinical study is it's really hard to fund because metformin is off patent. Yeah. It costs like four cents a day, and pharmaceutical companies aren't really keen to throw tens of millions of dollars into a study. Um and also pharmaceutical companies live by reimbursement strategies from insurance companies. And so they're trying to figure out what to do about aging. They haven't really solved that problem for the most part yet. Um, rapamycin, I think that uh, there are several companies that are trying to figure out strategies to target the TOR pathway uh, so that you still get the efficacy of rapamycin with reduced side effects. And, uh, there's a company called Torcep that I'm involved with, but there's a there's also a company called Restorbio uh, that's made a lot of news uh, recently. Uh, they had done three studies uh, looking at uh, proprietary mTOR inhibitors uh, that uh, given to healthy, relatively healthy older people to see if you can improve the immune response and prevent respiratory infections and which is a highly relevant topic these days. Yeah. Uh, and they were, they were looking at influenza vaccine, though, and they found that in two of the first two studies, including a phase two trial, they saw that a, a, a relatively short-term treatment with these TOR inhibitors was able to prevent uh, infectious disease uh, incidents even a year after the treatment ended in people over 65. So that's very promising. Um, they did a phase three study and it didn't show efficacy and so they haven't published that yet. Uh, they changed a bit the drugs they were using and so instead of using a Rapalog, which is directly related to rapamycin, they chose a different kind of TOR inhibitor and maybe that had something to do with it, but it's hard to comment on exactly what happened in that third study. I think there's a lot of promise though that, uh, that these interventions uh, may uh, provide resistance to acute uh, infections with aging if we do them correctly. And so to me, that's still a very promising findings. And we have to go back and look carefully at what was different about that third study. Uh, and can we continue to find better strategies to dose with rapamycin or better rapalogs that will have an impact on human aging safely? And I still think that's very likely to be possible. Very interesting. Um, I was also wondering about other supplements that like everyday people could like, could get hold of very easily. I mean, omega-3 or, you know, some other kind of turmeric or whatever that seems to be affecting health span and lifespan as well. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, the omega-3 story, there's a huge amount of clinical data. Um, my sense is it's probably beneficial to take some level of omega-3s. Uh, I, I think that if you look at things like vitamins, you know, in the large meta-analysis, they don't show benef uh, benefits typically with, for age-related diseases. And in fact, some cases, there's links to, to higher incidence of disease. But I think that's only because they're not done appropriately. So, right. you know, we tell people go out and take big doses of vitamins, but we don't tell people, why don't you go measure your levels of vitamins and see where they are and then try to supplement the vitamins that you're too low in, but don't overdose for the vitamins that you already have enough of. And uh, I think that if we took that more personalized approach, um, we would find that we could take things like vitamins and have a big impact on people's lives. And that's one thing we're trying to do in animal studies right now. We're using artificial intelligence-based strategies with a scientist here named Dean Ho 
uh, to try to do optimal dosing in animals to show that we can have a bigger impact on aging than if we just give them all the same dose. So um, uh, we have a, some early promise on that with rapamycin. So instead of just giving all the animals the same amount of rapamycin, we measure what's going on in their body and then adjust the dose in each animal uh, every couple months to try to optimize. And uh, it's early days with these studies, but I think they're, they're very promising. And my guess, and this is just guessing, is that if we took an individual uh, and measured all of these vitamins and micronutrients, these are all important molecules in the body. Nobody says they're not important. If we measured those things and then tried to optimize it in that individual, we might have a pretty big impact on their aging. Uh, we have some good data on vitamin A and vitamin D. Uh, and I think that the problem is that you can't just go to the store and buy a huge multivitamin and take it and expect any benefit because you're not doing, you're changing your state, your body from one state to a different state, but who knows what was optimal. Yeah, so, true. Uh, so we have to measure that. And, and uh, that's a different kind of, um, a different level of intervention. So it, it's not a mass market approach. It's an individual approach. And ultimately, I think that's where we're going to have the biggest impact is that we you know, take up a, a personalized approach to trying to optimize health in each individual. Right. So, so what you believe is that if we take a personalized approach to these different vitamins, like vitamin D, perhaps, I don't know, vitamin A, vitamin E, I don't know which, which exact vitamins, then you believe that that will actually have an effect on both health span and lifespan. Yeah, that's my guess, yeah. But uh, we don't have all of the data to back that up yet, of course. That's just speculation. Right. Uh, I think that, um, you know, vitamin D is a great example. Depending on what latitude you live at, uh, what the color of your skin is, um, your vitamin D levels could be wildly divergent. And many people are low in vitamin D. Uh, but that doesn't mean that people that have normal levels should be taking five times more uh, more of more than of something is not always good. <laughs> so yeah. I, I think that we need to take a bit a more nuanced approach to some of these things. Right. Where would you place your bets on vitamins and other uh, minerals, perhaps, when it comes to to health and longevity? Well, I you know I think that we're trying to screen through as many of these things as possible in animal models find things that show efficacy and then uh, move them into human clinical studies. So uh, I, the approach that I can take as an academic uh, is more agnostic in nature. I, can, yeah. I don't have to like bet the whole farm on one molecule. And so we, we want to serve that role is to try to really just compare things to each other and see which ones work best. Um, and of course, it's also interesting here in Singapore because we have three ethnicities uh, Han Chinese, uh, Malay, and Indian that are relatively underrepresented in aging studies. And so we may find that there are aspects of aging that are specific to these ethnicities or specific to living at the equator or specific to um, the lifestyle here in Singapore that are different from other places. So some of the, I think we'll learn a lot about uh, Singaporeans by doing these studies as well. Yeah, interesting. Um, you also mentioned stem cells before. Um, well, what are your beliefs of how stem cells can affect lifespan and health span? Well, let's start with the stem cells you already have, the adult stem cells in your body. Uh, most tissues, the ability of these stem cells to function with age declines. Um, we've done some studies in the, in the trachea, uh, and also uh, we've worked with Tom Rando and some studies in muscle stem cells. And one thing that seems to be happening is that uh, it, with aging in these stem cells, this TOR pathway that rapamycin knocks down, this TOR pathway gets aberrantly elevated. And when TOR is elevated, it drives these stem cells to differentiate. So you have some sort of damage to your trachea. You have to activate your stem cells to repair the damage. Uh, but you need some of the stem cells to go back into that quiescent stem cell state after it's done. If all the cells differentiate, you, de you deplete your stem cell populations with time. And we think aberrant TOR signaling is contributing to that effect. And that's one benefit of rapamycin is that it 
keeps Tor low in the stem cells so that they behave more like stem cells or they produce, continue to produce stem cells with aging. Um, so, you know, this loss of adult stem cell function in your tissues is probably having a big impact on aging. Um, and one of the things that was shown to be beneficial to adult stem cells uh, was uh, serum uh, from young blood. Uh, so these studies were done in Tom Rando's lab uh, by Irina Convoy and others, and, and they showed that if you fuse a young mouse and an old mouse together, there are factors in the blood of the young mouse that protect the stem, adult stem cells in the old mouse. Uh, and that's part of the reason you see these jokes about people getting yeah. transfusions of young blood all the time. Uh, I don't think that transfusing young blood is going to be the solution. I don't think that you'll get enough of those factors um, you know, doing it on a, a, a infrequent basis to, to really have an effect. But if we can define what those factors are and then supply those factors directly, that could really have a big effect on adult stem cell function. And then there's sort of the cell therapy-based models for aging that are developing as well. Um, and, uh, you know, at this point, I think they're still in the development phase. But if you inject mesenchymal stem cells into someone, or at least an animal, they stimulate or secrete some of these factors that are protective as well. So it may be that um, even if the stem cells don't engraft and make new tissue, that if the, the factors that they secrete are even beneficial. So um, I think there's a, a, lot to, a lot of development that still has to happen in the stem cell state, and we're not ready yet to replace damaged tissues with stem cells, but um, that, that's starting to emerge, and, and that ultimately this regenerative medicine-based regenerative medicine strategy may have a big impact on aging. Right. When it comes to you yourself, like what, what are you yourself doing to affect health, your own health span and lifespan? Well, you know, I, I'm trying to eat relatively healthy. I'm not great at that. I have, uh, when I'm not traveling, which turns out to be all the time these yeah. days. <laughs> uh, Except now, <laughs> probably. <laughs> yeah. I, I try to eat like one big meal a day and not have... And, and sort of do some sort of time restricted feeding. I'm also very much into exercise, so I'm uh, doing a lot of running and uh, 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 stationary biking. Um, that's an interesting challenge in Singapore because I like to run outside. So if you uh, quite my, hot, hot and up, humid, yeah, yeah, I'm getting up to ten mile runs now. But uh, the biggest problem is that I lose about three kilos just doing a ten mile run. So uh, I'm not sure whether the benefit I get is better than the problems with dehydration that come from running here. <laughs> right. but, yeah. uh, that's an interesting challenge in this climate. But I think that for me it's like, and I think this is important, is that I don't run because I'm going to be healthier 20 years from now, uh, although that would be nice. I run because I feel healthier now. I have more energy now. I'm more functional now. Mm. And uh, I think that if people can really... Um, get to a level of, of exercise it's, it's kind of like getting enough activation energy to get over that hump. yeah yeah uh, for sure. and once you get to a sustainable exercise levels i think that people will see the benefits of it now and not just in the future so to me exercise is very important right do you do uh, any you spoke about mindfulness before do you do any meditation or any mindfulness type things as well uh, not directly, except that I kind of get that through my running because it sort of clears my head. And yeah. especially after you go up a long hill, you know, you're, you're like on the way up the hill, you're like just trying not to die. And then you get <laughs> over the hill. <laughs> you're still trying not to die. <laughs> well, when you get over the hill, then you don't worry about that. And you've already forgotten about all your problems and your mind's clear to just think. So I guess, uh, I actually, I'm joking a bit, but I do think that I get uh, sort of a, a mindfulness effect from things like running. Um, For sure. Um, I mean, we, we've, been, we've been talking about a lot of different things here. Is there anything else that you would like to talk about or mention before we head off? No, not necessarily. I would say that I, I'm actually trying some of these supplements as well, I, particularly the one company I'm involved with, because I kind of feel like it's. I, I should uh, see what get some personal perspective on what it's doing if we're, if we're out there uh, trying to get other people to take it. For sure. And so, 
Um, I, I think that it's uh, a, a lot of people now in the aging field are starting to uh, test some of these natural products. And, and uh, so, um, again, I'm, I'm excited to get the clinical data to validate which ones are working. Right. And, 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 and the one that you're trying, is that the, what's it called, the GAD? Or what's it, what was it called? It's, it's AKG, alpha ketoglutarate. And it, again, I, I, this is self-serving, but the company's PDL Health uh, and uh, the product's called Rejuvin. But I think that um, uh, exercise, people, people that do bodybuilding have taken AKG for many years. Uh, they take it with other amino acids, which I'm not sure is a good idea. Okay. Uh, but, but AKG has uh, uh, been out there on the market. It's very safe. Uh, and uh, I do think it helps my endurance with exercise. So and there may be something to why these exercise people take it. Um, but, uh, you know, we don't, we think it's very likely to work. We don't have the double blinded clinical studies yet. We're just doing that right now. So hopefully that'll validate this approach. Uh, but I think that, there, you know, the, the NAD precursors are also interesting. And you mentioned things like turmeric and ginkgo and other things. And I think for the most part, we just don't have the quality data yet yeah. to know whether it work or not. Some of those things may work as well. Yeah. I mean, it, it seems like when it comes to like what, what we seem to be able to use of like all of this stuff it seems like this lifestyle and these things that you spoke about intermittent fasting calorie restriction exercise working on your stress levels working on your sleep for example um those things see i mean they that are things that people actually can start start implementing already today um and i guess also i mean rapamycin metformin all those things I guess we'll we'll have to see how everything turns out, and we'll we'll see like which supplements that will be proven to be like scientifically useful in the future, and then the, probably that will also have like a a, a big effect. Yeah. Probably, I agree with that statement. But getting people to change their lifestyle is not easy. No, <laughs> I, know, agree. We've got, I agree. We we've got most of the world, <laughs> you know, under lockdown right now, and you want to bet me whether they end up. I mean, gaining weight or losing weight during that period. Yeah, true. That's very, that's very true. <laughs> so this is a time when they have, you know, I mean, some people can some people can get outside and exercise, and some can't. I realize that, but this is a time when people have, you know, a lot of the things have, that they that take up time in their life has been reduced. They're not, you know, it's not as easy to go get fast food, you know, in, in many places, and and it's an opportunity to really develop a healthy lifestyle. And I hope people do that but i fear that um that things may go in the other direction so it's easy to tell people to 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 live all the right ways and 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 you'll be healthy longer but it's really hard to actually make them do that and so i think there's a space for these supplements and ultimately drugs and other approaches because um you know my goal is to keep people healthy longer yeah. and i'm not here to judge them whether they decide to you know go out and run five miles a day or not yeah yeah for sure um if somebody wants to like find you or your work like where can people find you um so uh we're just developing a website for our center for healthy longevity at national university of singapore so it'll be up soon yeah perfect um all right so uh before we head off i would also like to ask you just two more questions like if you would like to let's say that you're a uh, a person who have haven't heard about aging, haven't heard about you know lifespan or health span, even those words before. And if the, people would like to learn more about these things in an easy way, do you have any tips of books or you know web pages or YouTube or I don't know whatever? Like, do you, do you have any tips on where people can learn more? Yeah, if, if for one thing, if they just search on Google for health span and longevity, you'll find lots of articles out from major magazines and newspapers that have talked about this topic in recent years. I think that it's something that's growing in popularity. Uh, there have also been a number of books that have been uh, written recently. One of the most popular ones is by another scientist, David Sinclair. Uh, I forget the title of the book. Uh, but they're, they're really, uh, a lot of them address these lifestyle issues. They, they may disagree on some points, but they 
uh, try to get forth the concept of health span and not just lifespan. I think that's the most important takeaway is that when you tell people that you want to make them live longer, they're like, oh, I, when I get old, I don't want to live longer because I'm going to be sick and, yeah. uh, and my and my friends are going to be sick and or they might be even worse and, and uh, I'll be lonely. You know, Why do I want that? And, and I think what we're trying to tell them is that we're not trying to just make you live longer. We're trying to make you healthy longer. And exactly. Then they get it. I think that's the most important concept to get across is health span. For sure. Okay, so before we head off, what would you say, like, what is, like, the, the take-home message from today's conversation? Well, I, I think that medicine is really designed to do sick care, uh, and that was somewhat of a necessity 50 years ago. Uh, we did research on individual diseases at the time. We tried to treat individual diseases, uh, but now we've learned that these diseases, especially the chronic diseases, Uh, all share things in common, and the most important one is aging. Uh, and so it doesn't make sense to wait till people get sick and then treat them. Uh, when you do that, it costs a fortune, and you're not particularly effective at making them better. Uh, we need to start helping people throughout the life course while they're healthy to develop strategies that will keep them healthy as long as possible. So uh, I think that uh, I read a book by Michael Pollan recently, that was on uh, the use of psychedelics. Uh, and uh, I'm not suggesting psychedelics for aging yet, uh, but, but I, I think that his point in there was that a lot of these drugs help well people, not just sick people. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that's true for a lot of medical interventions. We need to figure out how do we help well people get better, not just wait till they get sick and try to cure them. And, and I think that's a fundamental goal of aging research is to keep people healthy. Yeah, that's very, 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 very good point to work on making people healthier longer. I mean, it's something that yeah. that I mean, it's something that everybody wants. Basically, I think that's one of the most important things for everybody, their health and and to be able to live healthy long, longer. So, but, but, yeah, and you can't start after you lose your health. You want to start while you still have it. It's much easier. For sure. <laughs> well, it's it's really been interesting. So. I would like to give a big, big thank you for for coming on and for for everything that you do, for the research that you you do, and and for yeah for sharing your your knowledge with us. So big, big thank you for coming on. Oh, thanks anytime. My pleasure. Hope you enjoyed the episode, friends. I really need your help. I'm trying to get the podcast out there, so I was wondering. If you could help me by leaving a positive rating and a review on your Apple device or the podcast player that you're using, as well as subscribing to the podcast. That really helps getting the show more visible on iTunes and other players. And if you don't know how it's done, then YouTube has a lot of great videos so you can search there. All right, that's it. Take care. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, including the giving of medical advice. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Hey.